In the early 1890s, Maria Egan and her Catholic family from Iowa opened a harness shop in Tulsa. Father William H. Ketchum, himself an Iowa native and pastor of some 18,000 square miles in northeastern Oklahoma, celebrated the first Mass in Tulsa in 1894 in the Egan's home over the harness shop. At the same time, Bishop Theophile Mearshart, a native of Belgium, was appointed Bishop of Indian Territory. When he visited Tulsa, he purchased a lot at 3rd and Frankfurt. He was hoping to create a Catholic school for the small but growing population of Tulsa. He signed a contract on July 1, 1899 with Mother Apolline of the Sisters of Mount Carmel to provide several sisters to staff the new school and direct the church choir. Each sister would be paid $20 per month. The parish now had a teaching staff but had no place for classes to be held. Bishop Mearshart appealed to an extraordinary woman for help. Mother Catherine Drexel, the famous millionaire nun, was a generous benefactress. She contributed funds toward the construction of hundreds of schools, one of which was the Catholic school in Tulsa. She agreed to lend the parish $1,500 to build a small school and convent. Bishop Mearshart assigned a very young priest to care for the Catholic families in Tulsa. When 25-year-old Father Charles Van Hulse arrived at the Tulsa Mission, he found nine or ten Catholic families and an empty plot of land where a church was supposed to stand. Early in 1899, the planning began. A small fundraising campaign netted about $1,400 for the church. Father James D. White, in his book, Tulsa Catholics, writes, On Sunday, September 10, 1899, the Tulsa congregation celebrated the Eucharist for the first time in its new church, which had been named in honor of the Holy Family of Nazareth. The next day, September 11, 1899, the sisters began classes using the church as a classroom until the school was ready a month later. The school was named St. Teresa's Institute as a condition of the loan from Mother Catherine Drexel. The school was in the middle of the city of Tulsa, with many friendly Indians as neighbors. The school and convent were a single, very plain, frame building with just sufficient space to accommodate the number of sisters and pupils at the time. The convent provided a small chapel, a parlor, a community recreation room, a laundry, a pantry, and a dining room on the first floor. Below this was a secret cellar where the mass wine was kept. On the second floor were bedrooms, and above this was an attic and sleeping quarters for local members in case we were unexpectedly surprised by visiting members of other communities. The school was on the first floor, three classrooms with plain furniture, and an office. Just 16 months into Father Charles Van Hulse's pastorate, he was transferred to Muskogee. He was replaced with his biological brother, Father Theophile Van Hulse. Father Theophile was shocked that his brother had lived in the small 10 by 10 sacristy. Father Theophile soon built a two-story, four-room rectory and moved out of the church. The third pastor of Holy Family was a visionary planner, Father John Hiring. He was born in Dyersville, Iowa on October 24, 1874, and was baptized two days later in St. Francis Xavier Church. This Gothic church of Father Hiring's childhood provided direct inspiration for the church he would build in Tulsa. Father Hiring was 33 years old in 1907 when he was assigned to Holy Family. By this time, Tulsa's cattle ranchers and farmers were joined by oil men, drilling contractors, roughnecks, and oil barons. This marked the beginning of rapid growth for the parish and the church building. The original church was small, boxy, and seated about 150. In its eight years, the parish had never found a permanent altar. Father Hiring developed a plan to expand and renovate his little church. He built proper transepts and installed a beautiful wooden raritos altar in the new apse. The expanded church could now seat up to 350. New walls require new windows, 
Several affluent parishioners donated funds to purchase those new windows and new pews. The city of Tulsa continued to grow through the discovery of oil in this part of the state. On Easter Sunday, 1910, Holy Family Church was simply too small and people had to peer through the open doors in order to attend Mass on Easter Sunday. This, of course, was not adequate. Father Hiring knew Holy Family, the city of Tulsa, needs a new church, one large enough to take care of the needs of its people. He wanted to build something that would truly be a symbol of all that he believed Catholicism was and is. We heard the good news that all debt is wiped out, and so we can, as many would, Fold our arms and take it easy. Not by any means. We need a new church building. Our parish must rank equal and abreast with any in Oklahoma. What has been done so far are only preliminaries. I might say the preface to the book of the history of the Tulsa Parish. The need for a new church was clear. Two questions remained, where should it be built and what kind of church should it be? At the end of 1911, David Connolly, an oil man and parish trustee, built a house in the wilds far south of Tulsa at 14th and Boulder. Mr. Connolly and some other businessmen purchased the lot on block 179, bounded by 8th Street and 9th Street and by Cheyenne and Boulder Avenues. Most parishioners lacked Connolly's enthusiasm for the site. They grumbled that it was on the other side of town. It seemed pointless and foolhardy to expect parishioners to pray in a huge church that far out of town. The site of the new church finally determined, and that moreover, Father Hiring now decided he must find out what kind of a church does he want to stand at Aiken Boulder. He took his plans, his dream for this church, to the architectural firm of Curtin, Winkler, and McDonald. And within that firm, he found J.P. Curtin and Dan Eichenfeld as the architects he wanted to do his church. He presented them with his plans on a large paper bag with his dream etched out. While he claimed his inspiration was the great cathedrals of Europe, it closely resembled his childhood parish in Iowa. Needless to say, you weren't going to build a church of this nature without some controversy about what it should look like. And so, having seen what Father Hiring wanted, the great Gothic building that mimicked his hometown church, the building committee hired, in secret, another architectural firm, William P. Ginther. And he came out with a totally different building, a Italian Romanesque building. So we move from marvelous Gothic arches to Romanesque arches, a totally different concept. One of the great concerns of the building committee was that the Gothic architecture would indeed be too difficult acoustically to deal with. And the history of Holy Family Cathedral would have proved them correct. However, Monsignor Hiring was not going to brook this kind of opposition. A secret committee bringing about a secret plan for his church. That wasn't going to fly. Father Hiring learned of the plans for an alternate church and was frustrated and annoyed. He brought the confrontation before the parish and asked them to vote on three propositions. Do you want the construction and advisory committees to continue? Do you want side doors in the middle of the transept? Do you want Father Hiring to continue here? The threat in the third proposition made it clear to the people of Holy Family Parish that Father Hiring was not tolerant of wasting time and resources fighting over the architectural style of the new church. The first two propositions passed by narrow margins. The third proposition passed 395 to 5. Emboldened by the support of his parish, Father Hiring decided to take the two architectural drawings to Bishop Mearshurton and have him and the diocesan architect in Oklahoma City help make the decision. The plans were presented to the bishop and the diocesan architect, and the Gothic plans were chosen. 
how much influence Father Hiring might have had over Bishop Mayershot on that, we do not know. We just know he walked in with two sets of plans, one he really liked, one he didn't, and he walked out with the approval of his plans from the bishop. On May the 23rd, 1912, with the approval of Bishop Mearshurt, Father Hiring broke ground right here at 8th and Boulder, the site that he had planned for his great church. And he opened the whole thing to the parish and asked for their assistance. The men of the parish excavated the whole basement of the church using their own mule-drawn carts to haul away the mounds of dirt. I have always said, many of the great churches of Tulsa were founded on oil men. Ours was founded on the backs of immigrants with their mules and carts. In late September, the contractor arrived and laid the foundation. Within a year, the brickwork began to enclose the steel superstructure. The new church was completed in 1914. On April 1st of that year, 3,000 onlookers witnessed a parade complete with clergy, a brass band, 13 altar servers, and numerous children's groups marching from the old church to the new one which Father Hiring called the Tri-Spire Jail. The Knights of Columbus Honor Guard kept watch while the clergy blessed the outer walls with holy water. The first mass in the new church celebrated the words and sentiment engraved on the front facade, Hic est Domus Domini, this is the house of the Lord. Father Hiring's grand new church was the tallest building on the Tulsa skyline. The rest of Tulsa would soon catch up. Holy Family's membership tripled in less than a decade. The numbers swelled to over 4,000 parishioners. The pastor and associate cared for the souls in Tulsa, Broken Arrow, Bixby, Jinx, Owasso, Sepulpa, and every other nearby town. During the Roaring Twenties, the city of Tulsa enjoyed enormous economic growth. Holy Family's three spires were joined by many of Tulsa's familiar skyscrapers. The city of Tulsa expanded in all directions. Father Hiring had a hand in creating St. John Medical Center, St. Patrick Church in Sand Springs, Sacred Heart in Skyatook, Immaculate Conception in Tulsa, St. Catherine of Alexandria in Tulsa, and St. Henry in Plunkettville. He was a key figure in establishing Calvary Cemetery and St. John Vianney Seminary, now St. Bernard of Clairvaux Church. 1925 was an auspicious year for the church in Tulsa. Holy Family was enjoying its silver anniversary as a debt-free parish. Bishop Kelly was an enthusiastic builder. He asked the Cardinal Archbishop of New York to visit Oklahoma that year. Bishop Kelly was not afraid to dream big. He wrote, I think it will be best to have a regular cleanup at the time you select. The Cardinal's job would be to consecrate the church and the next day to lay the cornerstone of the hospital. We could have a bishop lay the cornerstone of the Sacred Heart Church another to dedicate the Immaculate Conception, another to dedicate West Tulsa. The Benedictine sisters are going to put up a $25,000 building. We might have the cornerstone of that laid at the same time and probably turn the first sod of the Augustinian school. That would be a real cleanup. Bishop Kelly's dreams matched his mastery of public relations. Cardinal Hayes stepped off the train in Oak Mulgee and began a week of activity followed by the press at every stop. On May 11th, Bishop Kelly revealed a surprise he had been keeping. After Cardinal Hayes finished Mass at Holy Family, he stepped aside and Bishop Kelly conferred on Father Hiring, the man who was most responsible for this great and festive week in the city of Tulsa. 
you conferred on Father Hiring the title of domestic prelate, making him a member of the papal court. And from that point on, a title by Reverend Monsignor John Hiring. The next morning, Monsignor Hiring welcomed the Cardinal and a number of bishops back to Holy Family Church for the Mass of Consecration. During the five-hour Mass, bishops from several dioceses sprinkled the walls of the church with holy water, while Cardinal Hayes anointed the walls with sacred chrism. Cardinal Hayes dedicated the Sacred Heart Altar. That very altar is used today as the cathedral's main altar. Later that day, Cardinal Hayes dedicated Tulsa's hospital named for St. John, the patron saint of Monsignor John Hiring. He also broke ground at Sacred Heart Parish to mark the beginning of the construction of Tulsa's Art Deco masterpiece, Christ the King Church. The party returned to Holy Family for a banquet in the church basement. Cardinal Hayes offered a speech that evening. You have told me how much this day has meant to you. I doubt if you realize how much it has meant to me. Today I have sunk the spade into your soil. There we will sow Christ. From there will grow a church that is to be a source of strength and benediction to your whole city. I have laid the cornerstone for your great hospital, and I have consecrated your finished monument to Christ, your church. Never before in my life have I done these three things in one perfect trinity of a day. It is an indication of life, promise, and permanence. As today has marked a great day in my life, may it be to you symbolic and typical of your work. As Tulsa expanded during the 40s and 50s, so did Holy Family. One of the parish's sons, Victor Reed, entered seminary and was ordained a priest. He celebrated his first Mass at Holy Family. Parishioners were overjoyed when he became the parish's pastor in 1947. They were astounded in 1957 when it was announced that Father Reed would be appointed the Auxiliary Bishop of Oklahoma City in Tulsa. As an Auxiliary Bishop, he would assist Bishop McGinnis in governing the diocese. However, McGinnis suffered a fatal heart attack before Father Reed's ordination. Early the next year, Pope Pius XII appointed Father Reed as the fourth bishop of the diocese. The new bishop spoke to his flock. I'm not without a definite sense of wonderment that I've been chosen to be your bishop. Nothing, except the face of God, seems more important to me in the successful fulfillment of my responsibilities as your bishop than the realization of your sincere affection and goodwill. You know me as one of your own, and I consider this a great blessing. And my knowledge of you makes me proud, proud of being your bishop. Holy Family modified the interior of the church to accommodate the new liturgy following the Second Vatican Council. Seating for 200 people was sacrificed so the sanctuary could be expanded into the center of the church. Bishop John Quinn had been installed as the Bishop of Oklahoma City and Tulsa in January of 1972. In December of the same year, it was announced that Tulsa would become the sea city of the new Diocese of Tulsa. Oklahoma City would become the center of the new Archdiocese of Oklahoma City. Bishop John Quinn would become Archbishop of Oklahoma City. Together with the Diocese of Little Rock, the new province of Oklahoma City would encompass all Catholics in Oklahoma and Arkansas. Monsignor Bernard J. Ganter the Chancellor of the Diocese of Galveston-Houston was chosen to become the first bishop of the Diocese of Tulsa. He created a chancery office in a former bakery on the corner of 9th and Boulder. 
Bishop Ganter was ordained and installed as bishop on February 7, 1973. In 1978, Bishop Ganter was appointed the shepherd of the Diocese of Beaumont in Texas. The Pope chose Monsignor Eusebius Beltran from the Archdiocese of Atlanta to be Tulsa's second bishop. He was ordained at Holy Family Cathedral and immediately began working to expand the new Diocese of Tulsa. In the early 1990s, Bishop Beltran was appointed the Archbishop of Oklahoma City. He moved 100 miles down I-44 and worked closely with his successor in Tulsa, Bishop Edward Slattery, the third Bishop of Tulsa. Bishop Slattery and his predecessor, Bishop Kelly, are both past presidents of the Catholic Extension Society. The short history of the Diocese of Tulsa is closely related to its cathedral parish of Holy Family. Both Father Donovan and Monsignor Halpine managed the parish well, often through difficult times as downtown Tulsa transitioned from a booming oil town to a forest of skyscrapers. I just wanted to preach the gospel and I, tr and I tried to have it look nice and, uh, and especially um, try to get a choir going and, uh, and then gradually it became a very popular place for, for weddings and people would come down and see it. Bishop Slattery appointed Father Gregory Gear to replace the retiring Monsignor Halpine as rector of the cathedral. Father Gear invited Monsignor Halpine to remain at the cathedral. Together, they enjoyed the beginning of downtown Tulsa's revitalization. Bishop Slattery was eager to support his cathedral. He earmarked money from a capital campaign to go to the restoration and renovation of Holy Family. Father Gear made plans to address structural issues. He replaced the wooden spires with all metal ones and installed a fire suppression system, a new sound system, and handicapped accessible restrooms on the pew level. He fitted the spires and the nave with new copper roofing and oversaw the repainting of the church's interior. It has been my great privilege to be the rector of Holy Family Cathedral for the last 16 years. That is, 16 years of the 20 years that Bishop Slattery has been the bishop of the Diocese of Tulsa. As rector of the cathedral and as the superintendent of Holy Family Cathedral School, I have had the constant support of Bishop Slattery throughout this time. He has collected money to help support the cathedral in that the very first diocesan fund drive had over a million dollars put back to help support this cathedral, and that is what paid for the complete rebuilding of the entire attic of our building. He has been tremendously supportive of me during these 16 years as we have completely redesigned the interior of the cathedral and brought it back to its neo-Gothic architectural excellence. His time here with us at prayer, his concern for us liturgically, his concern for the well-being of the diocese spiritually, and the well-being of this cathedral specifically is certainly a great compliment to him. And it is our great privilege in our 100th year celebration to also be able to celebrate that one-fifth of that time we have had the same shepherd and the same guide as we this evening come here to celebrate our 100 years. Holy Family Parish began on the grassy prairie of Indian Territory. It survived an oil boom and a bust. It saw neighborhoods grow up around it and then depart for the suburbs. Despite changes within and outside the Catholic Church, Holy Family's clergy and parishioners have consistently shown the light of Christ to an ever-changing world. Father Hiring's triumph was the church he called his tri-spired gem. We place ourselves humbly before Jesus Christ and ask him for his continued blessings upon us. Thank you.